everyone, um, CIA Tech members and CIA Tech friends. I'm very glad you could join us this Tuesday uh, for our presentation by Dr. Patrick King. Uh, Dr. King is the current leader for global electronic strategies for Michelin. His activities heavily involve external electronic supplier relations as well as product development program support around the world. Prior to joining Michelin, Dr. King founded Technologies ROI and maintains both consulting and industrial RFID tag supplies within the supply chain industry and heavy industry. Dr. King's past includes the long history of products and achievements in the general field of auto ID in nine vertical industries. He has over 30 patents in the fields of auto identification, RFID, imaging, lasers, and printing, and publishes regularly in RFID trade journals. He's a member of Global AIDC 100, AIM Global Reg, and Michelin representative to EPC, contributor excuse me, contributed to RFID for Dummies, uh, the 2006 Percival AIDC Global Awardee by AIM Global, and recently was the recipient of the Outstanding Achievement Award for 2007 by the AIAG, which stands for the Automotive Industry Action Group. Um, we're very pleased and honored to have um, Patrick King with us this afternoon, or this morning for some of us. Um, and I, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Well, welcome, everyone. It's really a delight to be here. If you listen to that spectacular introduction, which I really appreciate, it was nice, you didn't hear Internet of Things. So what I want everyone to do is just kind of relax. I've got a couple of very key points about where all this is going, and I think that's really what I want to take away. But we're going to do it in a light way, and we're going to do it in a way that's intended to sort of reach uh, some of the ways in which you're thinking as opposed to tell you what to do tomorrow. In other words, I'm going to influence and hopefully provide distinct competitive advantages as things emerge, and they are emerging. And we'll touch on that, too. So I hope everyone enjoys this. Uh, I know I'm going to try to enjoy it. I apologize in advance if it's a little awkward. I have to introduce a video, and it's not going to smoothly. I'm going to have to go away from the set and back in. So just hang with me. But let's get it started. Internet of Things. Okay, I'm going to go, as I said, and I'm going to keep it at a fairly high level, and we're going to cover the topics of general interest, but I'm particularly going to focus on some of the aspects, and particularly topics related to sensors and serialization. Okay, I can't find a better way to get at the beginning of the Internet of Things than to just go right to Wikipedia. And if you can, if you kind of read the text and work with me, it's basically we're going to be marking everything, and everything's going to talk to everything. So as people have proverbially thought, well, maybe I'll have the stick of chewing gum in the grocery store tell me where it is and when to pick it up, or when we exchange articles, and basically everything just seems to come together seamlessly. Uh, this is the proverbial Internet of Things. Now, obviously, there are pragmatic and practical limits, and particularly cost and efficiencies and things. But the idea here, and for those of us that are old enough to remember the world without the Internet, uh, it's hard to even fathom the rate of change. Okay? So the takeaway on this slide is, yeah, right, Pat. That's really a pipe dream. Well, I caution you. I think as we might have thought of things in the 60s and even in the 70s, uh, you'd have had a hard time uh, literally describing what each of us experiences as our day-to-day -day existence today. So hang with me here. Okay, some of you already have some of those experiences. Those of you that are using Bluetooth for your cell phone can think of how many times it's dropped off. So what I want to do before we get into uh, some of the points that are really key, I want to let you know that it is an evolutionary principle, and you're living some of it today. And there's some good news and some bad news. So as you kind of think of it today, you think of things being connected or linked, and you have the notion of devices providing uh, sensorial information and transmitting data. But, but at the moment, you have to be a little bit guarded in the whole process. And we're going to touch on this a little bit more. But let's start with sensors. Let's talk about this data capture that's going to be shared in the Internet of Things. And let's just start with one sensor, and that's called you. So I want to start with each of you individually as a sensor, because you're not only going to be making 
decisions, business decisions, but you're going to be making decisions about whether what you're looking at is any good. So let's start with this simple device. I'd ask each of you to look at the screen and tell me how many triangles you see. So please take a moment. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two. In fact, you know, you can, well, you can see kind of a triangle right there, and maybe that's a triangle, and, okay? Everyone's counted. You have a number in your head. So let's continue. There are no triangles. There are no points between these lines for which any of these things are connected. In fact, if you look down here, it's easiest to say, oh, that's not connected. But your eyes and mine look in this region and still want to see a line. There is no line. You can see again over here. There are no triangles. So as we live in a universe and we make decisions and we make sensor decisions, we're a fairly imperfect sensor when it comes to these topics of registration and measurement. Uh, an optical device would not have looked for triangles unless you instructed it to. But we as humans want to connect things. We want things to make sense. That drawing that you see has no meaning, except we want it to mean something. And we see triangles. So for the rest of this presentation, I want you to know that I see a triangle. So you're listening to someone who sees triangles that don't exist. And I suspect I'm not alone. OK, so we've got this optical reality. Humans don't make great sensors for certain things. But does that make a machine a greater sensor? And I know that when we put out this possible presentation, a lot of things came to mind when it came down to the topic of marking everything or Internet of Things or, or machine sensor interfacing. And you can't help but go off in your mind to the point where you've got HAL in, the, in 2001 taking over, or you've got iRobot with the robots taking over, or Terminator with the world coming to an end, or 1984 with the government watching everyone. And, and unfortunately, uh, those aspects of science fiction are easy to conjure when you've got the tools and the resources and the machine capabilities. But the reality is, and I want to call your attention to it, it's really about business and business efficiencies and recognizing where the human sensor is not the sensor of choice. I don't know in your situations, but I can tell you in my day-to-day -day job and in my company that are run separately, the ability to rely on human sensing and determination is not particularly reliable. People defend their jobs. They, do, they, they report things that aren't real. They record things that they think are real. And it's not because they're good or they're bad. They're just human. And a lot of these cases is where automation comes to bear. And when you have automation, and automation becomes linked to automation, you have the elements of an internet of things. So again, I remind you, whether it's HAL over here, or whether it's iRobot, and, and actually, if you think of it for a second, there's a common theme there. In each of their cases, the robots in fiction were given human characteristics, which were grossly failed. So I'm not discounting that we may be imperfect sensors, but we are spectacular integrators, and we are the ultimate decision makers. So in the Internet of Things, taking the endpoints of either the left with HAL or the right with the deviant robots is not a space that A would be likely or be desirable, but makes for great movies. OK, so now we've gone through, and we've gone through a discussion of what the distinction at a very high level is between sensors, human sensors, and mechanical or electromechanical sensors. And I want to remind you that it's, it's exploding. It's exploding faster than any of us can imagine. But, it's, it, but it has its difficulties. And when you start to think of things that are crowded, what I'm addressing here is those of you 
who are actually trying to start to implement this, be kind of guarded. Uh, if you look at the progress with Wi-Fi in the uh, or 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 direct uh, RFID in your factories, it's taken 10 years to get it there. So some of the stuff isn't really going to happen as fast as I'm telling you, but it is happening. And it it can be wired or wireless. And uh, of course, the caution here is is the wireless requires the controlling influence over what else is going on in the background. And let me give you an example here. I was the managing director for Marconi, the same Marconi that invented uh, radio. I was the head of engineering. And on the 100th anniversary of radio, we were asked by the British government to duplicate the original experiment. In other words, have a receiver uh, in the UK and have a transmitter in, in, in Canada and transmit across the ocean. What, what could possibly be the problem? Well, it ended up that when Marconi did his test in 1899, it was by a spark discharge in a universe that the only competition was lightning. It happened to be a clear day, and, this, and the air was not saturated with radio transmission. We informed the British government it was not possible to duplicate that because of the fact that the spectrum is basically saturated. So I do give you some due cautions. Now the good news is, is, that, is that radio is highly regulated and governments have tremendous numbers of controls to avoid uh, interference. But we couldn't repeat that original experiment. So it's growing. And what I want to do is give you a little shot of how fast it's growing. I apologize, you won't be able to hear the audio, which is really great. But you will be able to see the video here. And it shows your iPhone. And you can follow with it. So you've got the internet, you've got television, you've got a garage door opener, you can change the channels, you can shred paper, you can vacuum, the scale, you can uh, shred cheese, you can fill bores, balls, you can uh, trim hairs, tase enemies. You can perform laser surgery on yourself, weigh animals, cook chickens, launch into suborbital space, predict the weather, tell you when to be afraid, pick a perfect mate. So now it's getting better. The latest accessory will actually put you in touch with God. You can use a pre-recorded prayer if you can't think of one for yourself. And the machine will pray for you. OK. So uh, Nicole, why don't we take a, just a quick, are there any questions, Nicole? Right now, we don't have any questions, um, okay. but we do have a request to see if you could speak up a little. Um, no a problem. Little bit those who are having okay. a problem. Thanks. Okay, I'm very sorry I wasn't uh, speaking louder already. I hope this is okay. Okay, so basically, when we when we've got all of this advances in technology and circuitry faster and faster and faster, what's it all come down to? And it all comes down to where is something, or what is something. So it's all about location, and it's all about items. And this is really where I want to do. I want to take you through this progress. And this happens to be a slide that I borrowed, but it's, it's, it's pertinent. And so for those of you that are working in RFID, you're already becoming aware of sensors, and then those sensors will become highly interactive. You can kind of think of it as this phase. But there's one element, one element that goes through all of this that is, that is really part of the takeaway from this, and I really want to be the key point, and that's the data. As you, and, and let's just take a simple example. Imagine my friend and yours, George Foreman, who named his five sons George. How does he possibly communicate with these people? Think of the fact that, that in the world of marking, 
that any of you would have the option of being able to identify the objects in your businesses. Well, what does that mean to the person that would have been sitting next to you had we been in a room? It means absolutely nothing. George Foreman knows exactly how to address his five sons. None of us do. You who have your ways of marking items that may satisfy your internal requirements are only as good as you understand them to be. These are all proprietary. And in the event that any of you are absorbed um, or taken over or change your IT systems, some of those decisions will no longer be relevant. And in a world of the Internet of Things, the most important thing is unique ID. Now, unique ID is actually the key. Otherwise, you, you have no real way of exchanging information back and forth. And this seems to be lost a little bit in a lot of cases where people are starting to implement solutions with RFID. You see, in barcode solutions, most people were not using a serialized ID. They were using a product ID. Now that things are getting to where we want to track them and we want to trace them from the beginning to the end, it's extremely important that you have the ability to communicate intelligently. And where these will become web-based, there must be a way to discern what any identification actually means. So for example, in programming information, you want to put a specific tag ID into what's called the unique ID, and it must be by an international standard. And if it's not by an international standard, then in fact you're only in the situation we had with George Foreman. So as you think of that iPhone beginning to offer all of these tremendous features, you will have become localized and limited. Obviously, as you do these and you go and add additional information, you have the requirements to additionally follow standards. And I'll use an example that applies in our own case with tires. With the, in my job at Michelin, if we want to place information about a particular distribution or particular information about the tire's maintenance, and that tire goes to a different location, if we don't follow a standard for marking that, then that data will become of no use to the, to the next um, person using the information. So again, the practical steps here in, in, in uh, B2B businesses or machine to machine is there has to be an intelligible database. There has to be a way in which you mark things. And the reason that I agreed to make this presentation today uh, associated with the Internet of Things is to let people know that as you're engaging in these exchanges within our industries, in this case in construction, and as you've participated maybe in some of the webinars or you've even done some of the applications with marking parts, tools, uh, uh, lay down yards for pipes, uh, equipment, scaffolding, and you've said, okay, I'm going to call this a, and I'll call that B, please remember that in the next person's shop, those two numbers have no meaning. You might as well be calling them George. It may be perfectly fine for you to apply these techniques of proprietary numbering in your own proprietary solution. But again, as those parts maybe are resold for second use, or they are taken up and placed into some leasing arrangement, or your companies change leadership or controls, any of the parts marking that you'll be applying so as to accelerate your business benefits will be of no value and will have to be, uh, will have to be redirected and remarked. Additionally, as you think of this, in the absence of using standards, even some of the sensor information is going to be lost and only controlled by the local uh, operation that you have. So here's the case, and this is another extract of the Internet of Things, and you've got all of this flow, and you've got all of these business practices, and you've got all of these things that allow you to amplify your business and communicate and follow the workflow business, and it all starts with item identification. 
you're only as good as what you name things. So here's examples here. Here's, a, here's an example of a road surface, portable road surface, that they lay down and they actually have tags in all of the sections on the road surface. And they actually can record the information of the parts as they're moving around. And I'm sure over time there'll be the ability to have sensor information. So they can, at that point, measure vehicle load and tolerances and make determinations and warnings and cautions. So here's a practical application today, an application that uses standards, an application that you can go along the road and actually identify each of the sections. And, and it is a case that if you were then to move this to another section in the absence of standards, none of the recording would be meaningful. Same thing here in the case of, of pipes and pipes that are in fact sent out and reassembled and disassembled. They need to have standards-based recording for pipe identities. And the same thing in the case of scaffolding. As you're marking any of these items, they have to have some arguable baseline intelligence that gives them something that's interchangeable between companies and enterprises. Now imagine that we're starting to work on the smart grids that we're all considering a key part of construction. If you don't have data exchange in a standards capacity, then you're going to have a situation where you'll have only individual companies and individual codes. And when you go and you move equipment in and out of operations, you will only be limited by what each of the companies can understand any of those parts to mean. Now, so we've, we've, we've gotten very vague, and we've talked about the human sensor, and we've talked about the electromechanical sensors, and we've talked about them coming together, and we talked about them being linked by the web, and we talked about the need for having a standards. So now we want to migrate a little bit into how the business decisions are rationalized or may actually be evolved. And herein lies the second problem. And if you read the second bullet here, you can see that it may be that everything that we've covered up until now makes perfect sense for one part of the business. But in fact, in the case here where the electricity savings is actually going to be benefited by an organization different from the one that's making the changes, these have to be strategic. So if you think of it then, and the place I'm trying to build this to, is that the notion of standards, and particularly of how things are marked, as they relate to all of the data collection and all of the abilities to promote and accelerate and automate business, need to be strategic. You don't just casually, at one plant or one section of your construction facility, decide to adopt standards and then in other sections basically mark what you want. It has to be strategic. So as we come toward the point where we're bringing some of this together with the key points, you're going to have to have issues of security. So the standards are going to have to be applied in ways where you control the, uh, the data. And that would be basically through what I've suggested already, are very strong government requirements and controls. The standards are the only way to achieve interoperability, as I've suggested already. And, and in fact, we're enjoying this already today. I used the example of the Bluetooth for the cell phone. And you know that those are interchangeable. You can buy one Bluetooth, and you can use it on your cell phone, regardless of which cell phone you have. This is because Bluetooth is an international standard. Had each of the companies been allowed to do what they might have chosen, you would have had to buy one Bluetooth for every phone that you have every time that you change a phone. And this is actually the essence of the requirements to be successful in the Internet of Things. There has to be harmonization and interchangeability. And then, of course, there are the social aspects. And if, as you can imagine, and I haven't touched on it, uh, there, there is, and it goes back to the discussion of the two movies I suggested or the four movies, it, there are fears. And there's lots of fears, but in all cases, 
the benefits outweigh the fears, and the fears are put aside mostly because of general social interest is generally held as the common basis for this to work, and the governments are very protective. Okay, so the summary here is we're already living in the Internet of Things. I think I've given you a couple of quick looks at how technology is moving or might be moving. The practical applications are emerging every day, and I'm sure you have your own examples. The virtual aspects of all of this must be considered because where this is really going, and, and as we build the simple models today with automation, eventually it will be device to device. And this is where the images of, of iRobot or HAL come in, because basically the sensors will act in their own capacities. And again, all of this cannot happen unless it's linked to serialization. They have to know what they're engaging and what they're interfacing. And for this, I would call your attention. And this was the essence of a webinar I gave a couple of, actually it was two months ago, on, on exactly the topic of standards on the data syntax standards of ISO and EPC, and on the FIATEC standards on, on data exchange uh, through the internet and the webs. So with that, I'm going to break again, and I'll engage in any questions. Um, thanks, Pat. I just wanted to clarify, too, that the ISO 15926 standard is one that FIATEC is working to develop. but. Um, and deploy, but um, not technically our standard. <laughs> yeah, no, I do no, no, no. no, the standards, the way standards are developed is expert groups develop the guideline for the standard, then submit it to be reviewed by an international community. So it becomes an international standard, but the groups themselves are basically the, the authors and the, and the guides, if you will. Thanks. Um, a couple questions? Someone writes, doesn't RFID mean radio frequency identification? Isn't RFID meant to only define the I I identity and not the external factors like location, sensing, etc.? Doesn't this extension of RFID create confusion for the market? That is, mixing the fixed ID and the dynamic characteristics create confusion. Yeah, welcome to reality. It, 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 you're absolutely right, um, and in fact, I'd spend most of my time when I speak about data and RFID moving sensors out of the loop because there is a tremendous benefit for the ID only. But there, is a, there, there are all of the elements of overlap, and frankly, in, in the construction industry, um, the sensor applications almost outnumber the ID only applications today. Uh, that won't be the case as this thing starts to take off. And you are correct. Keeping things relatively separate has a tremendous benefit. In our own example in my job at Michelin, uh, the group working on ID for tires is working on ID only. Now, ID only can mean more than just the serial number. There is a section in RFID called user memory, and this is where you make relevant input now, the, the, there were two thoughts around managing data. You either manage it on a local database, which could be in the case of a, of a piece of scaffolding. You could actually record into the RFID who is leasing it and when it's to be returned. And someone in the field could actually read that and have that information. Or the alternative is to have the ID only and have it managed by a remote database. Now, the database could be on a PDA but it's still a remote database. It's not programmed into the chip. But you are correct, but I will tell everyone that it is a continuum. And as you saw in that chart that showed Gen 1, Gen 2, 3, 4, 5, those may or may not be correct titles, but the, but the scope of the line is correct, and it is a continuum. Thanks, Patrick. Um, on your previous slide, we're wondering, is it a typo, or is there also an ISO 15962 standard? Yeah, the 15962 is a data syntax standard. It tells you how to program and the data compression associated with, um, with programming a tag, a Gen 2 tag. 
Thank you for that clarification. Um, next question, the speaker mentions the importance of identification to begin tracking. What can be said about the standardizing identification practices of, for example, pipe fittings, manufactured equipment, and even information? A Snickers yes. candy bar of a given size will always have the same universal product code. How is or is a standard ID created today for construction? There isn't. I'm, I'm trying to, um, and this goes back to the presentation, I'm actually trying to work with Viatech and with the oil and gas industries to extend the ISO standards for data marking into those industries. Uh, today, um, and uh, if you think of it, and maybe the easiest thing for some people to think of is if I use the retail example. Uh, retail adopted barcodes in the late 70s, and in this case, they only made product marking. So if you go to the store and you buy something, there's a barcode, and the barcode tells you what the product is. It'll actually tell you the company and the product but it won't be the serial number of the product. So you won't actually know unless you look it up. Uh, in fact, you can't look it up because you don't know, you don't have a unique number to that product. The, the enhancement that's em emerging in the standards today, and particularly driven by RFID, and in this case actually particularly driven by retail, is to add a few numbers at the end of the product barcode and then make it serialized. So if you were to take the example of cornflakes, you would not only reach and pick up a box of cornflakes, which has a UPC code, but you would actually pick up one that has additional serial numbers that is a specific one. Now you can look it up. You'll actually know where it was manufactured, when, where it was shipped, et cetera, et cetera, and any other relevant data. Same thing applies for any of us in construction uh, or oil and gas that are using barcodes today. As long as those barcodes only identify the type of product, they're not exhibiting the benefit of serialization. Now, they may be serialized, and you may be serializing them. This is six-inch pipe number one, and this is six-inch pipe number two. And they may be identical, but one has the number one and one has the number two. That's great. But those numbers are only meaningful in a small group of proprietary owners. And what I'm hoping to drive in this process is standardization according to the ISO standards, which for RFID is 18,006C, and for the data syntax is 15,962. Thanks, Patrick. Um, another question. I know there is a Gen 2 standard and products available. Are you aware of any Gen 3, 4, or 5? Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> 3, 4, and 5 are, in fact, if I could, um, Gen 2 is a little bit of a misnomer. For those of us that have been in RFID since the 80s, um, Gen 2 was, was the replacement for what's arguably Gen 1. Well, it just so happens Gen 1 was the name the retail group gave to what EPC was doing, where most of us have been practicing RFID for already 15 years. So we were kind of scratching our head, and we were saying, well, where did the name Gen 1 come from? And uh, so Gen 1, Gen 2 is already a little bit of a misnomer. But Gen 2 is what everyone's using today to describe baseline RFID. The 3, 4, 5 uh, are already in some sense being practiced, but they aren't called that. So for example, what was on that slide as Gen 3, which is really sensor-based, um, is already, uh, A, it already exists. B, many of you are already practicing it. Uh, in uh, lay down yard testing or uh, or in uh, there are a lot of cases in fact a seminar we gave a couple of weeks ago uh, 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 there was an example of uh, of real time locating for uh, for a lay down yard uh, with our active RFID so sensor devices are all real and happening so the gen 3 is already here although it's not called that uh, Gen 4 and 5, where things are starting to interact with themselves, uh, the whole company of, the whole country of Korea, the government has put tens of millions of dollars to drive what is in that slide, uh, level 4 and level 5. Uh, so it's, it's coming about, and it's, again, all being driven by standards. In Europe, there's an organization called Cassegrass, and they're driving Internet of Things at the level 4 and 5. So I hope that answers your question. If not, please ask it again or a different flavor of it. Thank you. 
Um, I think I have one last question, Patrick. Uh, can you clarify on your earlier slide when you were talking about the control of resources, whether um, you said government or governance for the control of the resources? Uh, which resources? Um, on one, uh, uh, the slide prior to the Q&A slide, I think you were talking about um, governance of the standards. Okay, I just just in general, I use the word. I only use the word government. I never use the word governance. So, um, but government is for, has been a very key influence in the regulation of of uh, of marking items and privacy and security, and uh, and and personnel. So there there are, if if the question relates to privacy. Um, all of the governments have very strong regulations on how that's being managed. If the question relates to uh, managing personnel through serial IDs, uh, I think there's, um, I think again, if it goes outside of, of human of the uh, of the uh, the of what the government allows, um, the government is steps in. Other than that, I mean, each of us have ID badges and etc. So I'm not sure I understand the question. I think the per the person was just. It wasn't um, sure if you had said government or governance, and was just looking for clarification okay. to put it in context. Okay. Yeah. By the way, um, I'm very sorry I didn't have the audio on that on that video. It's a fun video, and uh, and they do it very colorfully. But uh, we tested it. And we couldn't make it work today. Um, I've had a few. A few requests for the PowerPoint as well. So for those who joined us late, we have we are recording the session. We will post it in the media library. And um, Patrick, maybe we can just get um, a link to that video, and we can include that as well, so folks can download it and listen to the audio. Okay, that will work great. And again, right, this great. is the, this is not the, the standard topic for me. Would have been uh, would have been the more practical application of RFID, and particularly as it relates to data and standards, or in the case of uh, of uh, uh, rugged pipes and applications and things like that, um, but it, I, I, I really want people to understand as we move to the emerging technologies, and we all want to be successful businessmen, that you really have to have some core understanding of some basic needs, and I really wanted to touch on those today. So I want to thank everyone for your time and, uh, and uh, giving me the opportunity to stretch myself a little bit, and I hope that it was okay. I really hope that it was okay for everyone, and we, then everyone took away some business benefit in the process. Great. Thanks a lot, Patrick, and thanks for everyone for joining us um, this week. And uh, we will have the presentation up later today, uh, if not by the end of the day, um, certainly by the end of the week in our media library. And for anyone that wants to reach me, there's my contact information. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.